Hey, everyone. Hey. I this have is two hair. girls, one ghost. Two girls, one ghost. And we are your ghostesses. That's Corinne, and I'm Lava Girl, because <laughs> that's what I look like. It doesn't look as pink as when you first called me. It's fading a little bit, but it's very pink. I love it. When you, you did your hair the other day and you curled it because you have so many layers, I feel like you just looked like probably the coolest person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I was like, damn. Oh, thank you. Well, I do want to give a shout out to Karina, who did my hair. If you're in Atlanta and you want to get your hair done, highly recommend her. All Hollows Hair, Karina Fisher. She also is such a spooky bitch. I loved it. I walked into her studio and it is, I sent you a couple pictures, Karim, but I'm like, yes. this is, I was like, if you ever want to start a side hustle of like designing a podcast recording studio for Corinne and I, yeah, please. Or if she ever did her own podcast, she would already she would just be able to do it from she her. She just do it from her hair salon. Yeah, it's so spooky. It was so yeah. witchy. What you sent me, like, it's giving like dark academia vibes. Oh yeah, big time. So anyway, I highly recommend her. She's great and. You know what? When I first saw Shark Boy and Lava Girl when I was a kid, I was so <laughs> jealous of Lava Girl's hair. And now I get to be her. You actually followed through, which is something you and I, when we make decisions as a podcast, very rarely do. But you said, I want pink hair. Mm -hmm. Did you even say it on a recording or did you say it on Campfire Stories? It was on Campfire Stories last week. Okay. And I said, do you dare me? And you said, yeah. And then I said, okay, next week I'll be back with pink hair. And here I am. And like three days later, you call me and you have pink hair. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Incredible. I love it so much. Thank you. I have a little bit of a ghost story update-ish oh. for you. At your I house? Think, no. Oh. It involves my friend Allison. <laughs> okay. Who's from Marblehead. Uh -huh. I feel like Allison tells me all of her ghost stories and I have never once asked permission to tell them on the podcast. I just immediately run to the podcast and tell them. So, I love it. Anyway. I think she knows what she got your, herself into with your friendship. And she listens. So if she were like, if she didn't want me to say it, I think she would say, by the way, hey, like, bitch. don't tell anyone this, but here's what happened. Yeah. Because so, okay. she knows that I'm, I'm talking about it because she hears it. Anywho, probably like six-ish months ago or more, I came on to this podcast to talk about how she had told me that in her dad's- You came on to this podcast. I guessed it for the first five I minutes. Guessed it. I guessed <laughs> it. Also, apologies to everyone for the nasally sound coming out of my mouth. I have a cold and I feel like I never get sick and now I'm such a baby when I do get sick. Anywho, <laughs> Allison's dad works in this old, it was like an automotive shop. He doesn't use it for that, but like that's what it once existed as. And mm -hmm. so it kind of has this warehouse vibes. And I know I've talked about times when, you know, like the lights would turn on and off and like the knob is basically impossible to push up or down. And so there's just like a lot of odd things that have happened in there. And probably sure. about six or so months ago, maybe a little bit further back in time, he had been, did I tell you this? That he had been pushed to the ground, that there was such an extreme like jolt of energy that went through him. And he basically like fell back. And he was really confused because he had been sharing this space with whatever paranormal activity was going on in this mm -hmm. spot for a long time. And it never felt aggressive. It never felt nefarious. And so he was just kind of like, what the hell was that? Why did this just suddenly yeah. happen to me? Like it, it felt not knowing why or what that was. It did kind of feel like an aggressive move. Absolutely. And so it remained a little bit of a mystery until a few days ago. We got answers. We got answers, which is like, oh I was gosh. telling Allison, I was like, this is the coolest thing when stories kind of like unravel and unfold. Come and had this not happened, he would have never understood what he was experiencing in that okay, day. Okay, so what happened? So at his shop, there is a part of his like driveway at mm -hmm. his office. A lot of people end up using to like just turn around, basically. He noticed the other day that a car had pulled in, but they didn't pull back out. So he went out to be like, hey, can I help you? Like, what's going on here? And got to talking with this man who had pulled in and the guy was waiting. He was like, oh, sorry. Like this place had been abandoned for so long. It was one of my good friends who used to own this place and use it as an automotive shop. So sometimes when I'm early for like an appointment in the area, I will just kind of hang out and park here. I didn't really realize it was in use. Sorry about that. And 
Allison's dad's like, oh, and so it like starts to kind of talk with this guy about the history of this office yeah. and his friendship with this guy. Also, sorry, construction. There's so much. I'm giving so much noise that is not good for podcasting in this exact moment. <laughs> but he, in speaking to this man, learned that the person who owned the building had died of electrocution. <gasps> So when he felt that extreme like wave of energy and like basically shock go through him that pushed him down to the ground, it was not a spirit coming up and pushing him. It was likely that person trying to kind of show him what happened to him or some sort of like residual imprint of that event. And it happened in the shop. I believe so. Whoa. Oh my gosh. That's one that's so tragic. I know. But- the fact that he was able to get that answer. Yeah. And I hope he like speaks to the, the spirit in the warehouse now and says like, I I know who you are. Yeah. I see you. I acknowledge your existence. Right. Because it never felt peace. bad before. It felt like they were just kind of coexisting. Like they were maybe sure. buds or something, you know, coworkers in the same space. <laughs> but I did think it was really lovely, despite how horrific that person, his death was. I found it quite lovely to like have the answers of what happened and realize that your relationship that you had with what you thought was the energy and the spirits around you was accurate because this was like the one outlier event that felt weird where he was like, what is this? Even when you explained it, though, it didn't sound like he was scared of it. It was almost like a shocking like this felt weird. It didn't feel like it was a malicious intent, at least the way that you reiterated the story to me. But Wow. Pretty wild. That's amazing. And also sad, but what a cool full circle ghost story, which is so rare. It's so rare to actually like get an answer to understand what actually happened to you. I know. And I was, and then I defaulted to telling her about Greg and Dana Newkirk and that interview that we had with them and just kind of like them talking about like finding all the clues and the pieces and they're not always in order and they don't come when they're necessarily supposed to, but you just have to like remember them and kind of piece them all together when the time comes. That was one of my most favorite conversations. I could talk to Greg and Dana for hours and hours and hours. I know. We should just have them be two more people on our podcast and just the four of us every single week. Yeah. Which is really unfair to them because they know so much more than we do. So it's just us just listening and being like, whoa. (laughs) Right, um, which we could basically do by listening to their podcast. Right. <laughs> but we want to be a part of the conversation and ask questions. We want to ask questions live. I do have a book recommendation for everyone. Ooh, okay. And at this point, we have not yet had, when we're recording, we have not yet had our book club discussion of A Court of Thorns and Roses. So we haven't picked our next book club book. Once we do, we will announce it. And I think when in doubt, go to our Instagram because we'll we'll have a highlight on our Instagram, which will be about our Patreon about a book club. and book club. So yeah. you can check out what we've decided, which always yeah. happens at the end of the book club discussion. So when people mm-hmm. join our Patreon and join the live book club discussion, at the very end, people pitch books. We all choose and then we, and then we gather back sometime again yes. within the next couple months. Quarter. Yeah. So last time when we were trying to pick a book, one of the books that was recommended was The Sundown Motel. And it's written by Simone St. James, who wrote Broken Girls, which we read many moons ago as a book mm-hmm. club before we even had an like official Two Girls, One Ghost book club on our Patreon. We had decided to read that. You and I read it together and we talked about it on the podcast and with you, all of our listeners. Yeah. And actually, I kind of feel like because there are other listeners who run book clubs through Goodreads and yeah. through Facebook and stuff. So that happens a lot more frequently if people are looking to get into a book club outside of the quarterly one we do. I would yeah. recommend that. But I kind of think I might be misremembering, but like, is that how we found that book in the first place? It, it might have been. have been. But so Simone St. James has written a couple other books. The Sundown Motel is one of them. I have like a hundred pages left in this book, but it's really good. I feel like she does a really good job of telling stories that are split timelines. So it's like one was past, one is present, and they're both like really haunting. It's kind of investigative. There's a mystery, an unsolved murder of some kind, and a lot of hauntings. I love this. So if you like a book that is a little bit spooky, but Murder Mystery, I highly recommend Sundown Motel. Okay. It's a good read. I'll buy it. I've Why don't I just give it to you? I'll just give you my book. That would be I'll nice. Send it to you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. 
but I have been buying a lot of books and not reading many books because I'm kind of like I have that backpiling as many as I can because I know that when I go on my maternity leave, like I've had friends be like, here's the thing about maternity leave is if you're planning to breastfeed, like you can't do much. Like you're just kind of like tied to your house and to your baby. And so, yeah, you're always busy with that, but you're like not mentally stimulated a lot of the time because they're always sleeping for the most part, or you hope that they are. (laughs) Yeah. For the first couple months. Yeah. Yeah. And so people, I had a few friends talk about like different TV shows and I was like, I don't want to be like baking my eyes into the television and rotting my brain the whole time. So I've been collecting like a huge stack of books. I'll have to show you because I bet you've read most of them. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'll also send you some. Why don't I, every time I finish a book, I'll just send you my books. My care package. Or you can, yeah. yeah. Well, you finish, I feel like you finish a book like multiple times a week. So you can just once a month, send me some. Forget sugar mama. I'm your book mama. I need a book mama. Everyone needs a book mama. But yeah, highly recommend it. Do you need book recommendations or do you have plenty? Okay. Here's one of my challenges. I don't shop on like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anything for books. I always go to local bookstores. Yeah. And I have gone in the past two weeks probably to five local bookstores in the North Shore. Like whenever I'm mm-hmm. I'm in Lynn, I go to one. I'm in Beverly, I go to one. I'm in Salem, I go to one. I'm in yeah. Rowley, I go to one. You know, like wherever I am, I pop in. It's my favorite thing to do, go to local yes. bookstores. Like, like that is the most romantic self-care date yeah. I've ever had. Yeah. It is really lovely. Though I will say zero of them have had Riley Sager books. And you got me into Riley Sager. We read one book together. Mm -hmm. As our book club book this past time, or two times ago. What did we read last time? We're reading A Court of Thorns and Roses right now. Oh, currently we are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our last discussion. They haven't had any Riley Sager or Lisa Jewell, and I am like, well, I just want to go through their entire catalog. I'll be your local bookstore. Also, you know what you can do, and I highly recommend this, is order online from local bookstores because then they can like get the book. Oh, I didn't even think of that as a You're still providing business to them. Yeah. That's I do that with the last yeah. bookstore in LA. Okay. That's a great recommendation. Mm-hmm. I totally did yeah. not even think of that as a possibility. I was like, they're small, they're local, they don't even have a website. But that's the not magic true. of the interwebs. But this is an episode where we talk about paranormal stuff. And if you're new here, we at Two Girls, One Ghost spend about 10 to 15 minutes in the beginning of the episode shooting the, I was going to say shooting the ship, but like that, I don't like that for, term of phrase. We just chat. We tell you ghost stories in our lives. We also tell you updates on our lives. Sometimes we talk about the weird things that our bodies are doing. And then we get into the paranormal where we do Mm -hmm. research stories every week. And we also do encounters. So those are our other types of episodes. But here's something for all of you to know. When you're listening to our podcast, we love the paranormal. We want to suspend our disbelief and we want to believe. We know that not everyone believes in the paranormal And that's totally fine. That's your prerogative. Go for it. We are not going to tie you down and force you to believe. We might if you give us the opportunity, but we won't force our opinions onto you. We just want to share good stories and just know we believe because we want to believe. We understand that there is healthy skepticism. But if you are providing a ghost story to us, who are we to tell you that that did not happen? No, we're not. I mean, I don't think we ever think that. So, ever. so for people who have some skepticism, know that that's not our natural track because we right. both come from very haunted backgrounds, very haunted homes, very haunted yeah. lives. So we've experienced a lot. Therefore, we do realize a lot of other people out there have experienced a lot. I will say if yes. you are here, hopefully it's because you have a little bit of interest enough to like be open. You're curious about it. Or you can just be here, not believe in any of it. And just enjoy ghost stories. It's one of the oldest forms of storytelling. Let us lull you to sleep. Also, we might end up making things worse in the sense that we have twisted dark minds. So you might tell us a story about a very sweet, beautiful little butterfly ghost and we will turn it dark. We'll find Give us the opportunity and we will. Yeah, we start in the darkness and work our way up into the light. Sometimes. Me more so than you. I like to live in the darkness. <laughs> okay, well, I have a story, a tale for you, Sabrina. I believe I heard about this from a listener, perhaps when we were on tour. I did okay. not write down anybody's name. So I apologize if this is something that one of you guys told me about. 
But I thought this is a great topic to cover. We're going a little bit heavy on the history with this one. But we're venturing, yeah. Sabrina, to your home state. I know. I'm really excited. New Jersey, baby! Joy-Z. Okay, so I looked up some fun facts about New Jersey to share with everyone. Oh my gosh. So New Jersey me. is home to the longest, the world's longest boardwalk. It has the oldest seaside resort in the U.S., which, Sabrina, that's Cape May, which you used to mm-hmm. go to. Yeah. Thomas Edison's laboratory was in New Jersey. How cool. And... The very first drive-in movie theater. Ah, the romance. That's so cool. I know. And New Jersey is also the number one spot for battles during the Revolutionary War. So a lot of death, a lot of history. And New Jersey has currently the highest density population of any state in the U.S. So it is densely packed with people, densely packed with history, and densely packed with ghost stories. This is why I love Jersey. So we've covered some of New Jersey's spooky hauntings and places and creatures like the Jersey Devil and and things like that Mm -hmm. in the past. But today we're going to focus on one particular house. It is a home that saw and hosted the beginnings of the United States of America. This is the Proprietary House in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Oh, is it a museum now? Like, do people visit it? Because I'm pretty sure. Have you been? I, that sounds so familiar. Now I'm going to look at a... Can I look at a picture of it? Is that going to ruin yeah. anything if I do that? No, 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 no. It's kind of near Staten Island. It's like across the okay. water from Staten Island. So not near Jersey City. I definitely played like sports in Perth Amboy. Yeah, that's south. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know that I've been, but okay. I know Perth Amboy. It is a museum. Yeah. So you're correct. So if you didn't know if you've been there, like I'm sure you know other people who've been or maybe you guys talked mm-hmm. about it in school because it's a, a local and also it's part of the U.S. history as well. Yeah. So it's called the proprietary house. And I was like, well, what the fuck does proprietary mean (laughs) in this situation, in this setting? And so I will tell you, a proprietary colony was a type of colonial administration during the 17th century when America was still very much under British rule and people Mm -hmm. were still scheming about how to break up with the UK. They were like, we don't really like you anymore. Let's stop kissing. And so these colonies were governed by a Lord Proprietor who was of royal charter. And basically oh. under the crown, there were three types of charters. There was the proprietary, the royal, or the charter. And a proprietary system allowed people or companies to basically have a lot more freedom. So they got like the blessing from the crown, from the king and queen to go and you know set up a colony, set up shop somewhere. Okay. But they ultimately could make decisions. They didn't have to run back and get permission for every little decision. They very much were given the authority to select governors and so basically they acted independently. This is where the uh, the Brits started to lose control, probably, yes, very slowly. Totally. You start to give a little bit of power to other people, and then and they want like, it all. Actually, this is working better without you. Yeah. Huh. So this is how a lot of America was established. We learn in school about the 13 colonies and the various settlements in these 13 states, these 13 colonies. Mm-hmm. And by the 18th century, the crown was cracking down, trying to convert all of these different establishments that they had allowed certain, like the proprietorships and whatnot, to turn them into crown colonies and attempt to regain some of that control that they had lost. But as we know, in 1776, now I'm thinking of Hamilton, Britain's attempt to hold on to the colonies officially failed. The 13 colonies issued a declaration of independence, severing their political connections to Great Britain. You've seen Hamilton, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't seen it on Broadway, but I saw the Disney yeah, yeah. version of it. Yeah. yeah. All I can think of now is just the King George. I love him in it so much. I know. That is one, though, I had to watch. Like, I was glad that I watched it in that setting because I think if I had seen it in on Broadway, I would have been like, is there a possibility to have subtitles here? You know? Oh, Yes. Which I went subtitle to theater, which was the best thing because I already knew most of the words and there you go. lyrics. Yeah. So I actually understood what was happening. I was in on all the jokes. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today the proprietary house in New Jersey is the only proprietary governor's mansion from the original 13 colonies that's still standing today. So wow, all other impressive. governor's mansions throughout the entire 13 colonies have been destroyed or 
repurposed in some way, but like they're just like not standing as they were. This is the only one. Very impressive. Wow. It was constructed in 1762. The construction was completed two years later. And it's a Georgian style mansion that originally had four levels with a kitchen, a wine cellar, servants hall, butler's quarters, housekeeper's room, all in the basement. And then on the main floor, there was the governor's study, the dining room, the breakfast parlor, the drawing room, all that sort of jazz. Wow. And then upstairs, primarily the bedrooms, dressing rooms, servants' quarters. And there were also 16 fireplaces. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. How dreamy. I know. It's so dreamy. I want a blueprint of where they all were. I Did know. every room have one? Well, have they completely remodeled it or is it pretty similar to what it was? There's been some remodels, but mm -hmm. right now it is being restored slowly to its original state. <sighs> that is so So I don't know cool. how many fireplaces they're like putting in or if they all stayed. I don't know those details. Right. But this place was first occupied by Chief Justice Frederick Smith and with the permission of the proprietors, because they had to grant him permission, he was able to stay in this house for a very short amount of time. But by May 1773, the mansion was spruced up again after he spent, spruced I think, up. like a decade or something in here. And then they were like, you know what? We're taking over the mansion again. We're sprucing it up. We're making it pretty because maybe he didn't take good care of it. I don't know. But they right. were prepping it to be the home for the royal governor of New Jersey. And do you know who that royal governor was? No, I do not. It was William Franklin, who was the illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin. Oh, my gosh. I know. I was like, it's wow, It's so ben. weird how when you really think about it, all of these like big names that we learned about, we knew nothing about them, you know? No, we did not. Yeah. We barely know anything. Uh, what I know of Ben Franklin is that I hope to see his face when I pick up money on the street because... He's on the $100 it's a good bill. one. So that's, good I do hope it. I see him often. Yes, yes, yes. I have never been graced with that opportunity, but maybe one day. Me neither. I think I've only ever found money on the ground once, and it was in Thailand, in Bangkok, like the busiest city. So like, mm. we were like, what do we do with this money? And so we kept it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if money comes to you. That's it. If there's yeah. no one around, like frantically looking for their money, and you kind of pause for a couple of minutes and still nobody. Right. And it's a You're public like, okay. space. You're not like in a bathroom or something. Like, yeah, whatever. Right. And to be fair, it wasn't that much in currency. Like, I think we got probably like equivalent to like seven US dollars. It wasn't like we weren't rich. That'd make me feel rich. That was enough for a massage in Thailand. <laughs> Jeez. Oh my I God. I know. The best. Uh. Yeah, that's incredible. Also, side note, I learned this in researching William Franklin, that mm -hmm. Ben Franklin was born on Milk Street, which, Sabrina, I have taken you to Milk Street. It's in Boston, and it's where Ogawa Coffee is, where, oh, yeah. remember, like, the cappuccinos, and the they Halloween do, like, really ones. cool cappuccino foam art, and we went and got, like, yeah. gravestones and bats and ghosts and stuff during October. Benny Boy, he was birthed right born there. right there? Wow. Yeah. Okay, but back to William Franklin. So we don't really know much about the identity of William's mother, but we do know that shortly after he was born, he moved in with Ben, his father, into his home, and it was there that he was raised in his home. So, you know, quote unquote, illegitimate son mm -hmm. or whatever, but like really he was, it doesn't really mean much in terms of how he, what his childhood sure. was like. As New Jersey's royal governor, he did some really great things for the city of Perth Amboy, he raised money to fix and build roads and bridges, and he introduced a farmer's welfare program, which I don't know any more details, but just like the title of it sounds great, and I feel like that probably was very needed. And he also established America's first Indian reservation, which, you know, that's a convoluted topic, like what was his responsibility in sure. displacing the people to begin with? Did it influence other people to push others out and be like, you're only allowed in this one little spot? I don't know. <laughs> But it was listed on his can uh, of worms accomplishments. Opened. Yeah, a can of worms are opened. But for the most part, William was held in high regard by the people of New Jersey at this time. Mm -hmm. But William, there's some drama because he was a loyalist to the king. And so when the American mm -hmm. Revolutionary War came into play, it really caused a rift between William and his father. And William just would not budge. And Ben was like, what the? fuck are you thinking like this is america baby 
release your relationship with Britain. And William was like, no. And then he's like, okay, well, then you're not my son. And then he was like, well, you're not my dad. And then they basically became estranged. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Big drama. I mean, it is interesting because even today, like in today's day and age, I think politics can very greatly sever relationships. Mm-hmm. Like I have very different opinions than my parents. I'm fortunate enough where I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to change my parents' opinions and I'm just going to live my life over here. Still love them. But I know right. of other people who it has like severed relationships. Right. Like their their choices and their beliefs don't affect your day to day and your ability to like live sure. and have relationships with other people. But that's not true for a lot of people. Yeah. But it is interesting with Ben and William because it's like, you know, William was raised by his father, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the most influential people when it comes to mm-hmm. founding America. And so it is interesting that like his beliefs didn't really trickle down and that there well, was. Well, I mean, I think it just proves that nothing really has changed in, t- in the terms of humanity is we always want to have this like independence from our parents. Like at a certain mm-hmm. point, children do rebel against their parents. And I think that has yeah. been true throughout history. Yes. It is interesting, though, because I feel like if I had to guess, I would have said the opposite for like what team they were on because typically yeah, it's like sure. the older you get the more headstrong you stuck are in your ways you already have you're stuck yeah. in your ways and then it takes the younger person to come in and be like let's change things let's be flexible but it right. was the opposite hmm. so they're estranged now they like basically okay. don't have a relationship franklin moved out of the proprietary house in 1776 well rather he was he was forced out of the house. I was going to say, was, why would you willingly move out of there? Right. A beautiful, big-ass mansion with 16 fireplaces? You wouldn't. But he I'll was... i in right now. <laughs> yeah, please invite us over. He was ordered to be held under house arrest. And tensions were really, really high at this time because those who supported America's independence and those whose loyalty wavered towards the crown were like super butting heads. And this was June of 1776. So it was... It was just a few weeks before the Declaration of Independence, right? So he was arrested. And then after being on house arrest, he's arrested at like the the steps of the house. He's Mm -hmm. brought to Princeton for trial. He's convicted of treason. And then he's sent to prison in Litchfield, Connecticut until 1778. So he didn't spend that much time in prison. But so he was sent to prison for having different beliefs or was he conspiring against the um, like the 13 colonies? You know, I don't know. I did try to look okay. up some details of his arrest and it was really just falling back on treason. And I I'm curious if this is something where it's like one of those historical moments where it's like, was there actually proof or not? But to mm-hmm. be honest, I didn't look that hard. So maybe if I'd spent five more minutes, I would have an answer for you. To be fair, you are giving us a lot of history and I'm really appreciative of it. And 14 <laughs> year old me would be like, who are you, Sabrina? So, yeah, you know, I'm here you, for it. OK, gets the point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was around this time or a little bit later that the house suffered some serious damage during the American Revolutionary War and the entire interior went up in flames and it was abandoned for some time until okay. 1794 when a merchant bought the home. This guy said he was a merchant from Perth and boy, but really he was basically a spy because he was an operator for the British Secret Service. And while he may not have been loyal to his new country that was built, there actually wasn't anything nefarious going on in terms of like his desire to live in this house. Because at first I was like, oh my God, it's a spy camp. It's like the cave and Spy Kids, the first movie. No, he just... He just wanted the nice house. He fixed it up. He put on a new (laughs) roof. He was really just, yeah, trying to make it a livable mansion. He was just totally fixing it up. But in my mind, he was a a crazy secret spy government agent. Have you watched the new Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Amazon? I did not know there was one. No. Okay, I didn't either. It's so good. It's with Donald Glover and then Maya from Pen15. Oh. (laughs) And... So it is It is like a drama, but it is also a comedy. And it mm-hmm. is so, I really, really loved it. If, if you're okay. looking for a show, I highly recommend. Mr. and Mrs. Smith was the first time I heard the word pussy used other than to describe a cat. You did tell me so, that. Yeah. Yeah, I have some weird memories associated with that movie. Um, but I'll watch it. 
Okay, so the house, or maybe this man, seemed to be a target because once again, a fire destroyed the home. And this is also one of the confusing parts of history because there were multiple articles that I read that described two different fires happening. And then there were multiple Mm. articles that I read that kind of described only one. And so I'm not sure if the timelines are off here, if there was only one fire ever at this house or if there were two. But I'm going to say two because I did find a few different sources that said that there were two. Okay. So a fire destroyed the proprietary house. And seizing the opportunity to take on this potentially cursed property for a decent price, this New York hotelier, this rich man, he bought it. He added a large three-story addition. He added two stories to the main house. And he opened up the Brighton, a very popular hotel. Oh, in his, oh. Yes. I yes. did not see that coming. But I guess he's a hotelier, so I should have yeah. put that together. Yeah, he had some funds. He had some money, and he was like, "This will be a great spot." It had a lot of properties. It was like very, very beautiful. It had water access. Yeah. You know, like it was. It kind of actually reminds me. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, but the Woodstock Inn and Resort in Woodstock, Vermont, which is where I did my bachelorette, it kind of looks like that house. Interesting. It's like this quaint yet kind of grand estate. Is it colonial in style, or what's the? Yeah, it's like a Georgian colonial. Okay. Yeah. So there's a place called Washington Crossing in right next to my mom where she lives in Washington Crossing, mm. Pennsylvania. And that's what I'm kind of imagining it looks like. Yeah. No, I'm sure it does. It kind of it has that like colonial face where it's just like, you know, like the classic box. But this mm-hmm. guy, when he bought it, he did do some renovations. So he took some of the original designs out of the house. Like there were these massive like brownstone steps that led up to the house. Mm. And he took them down to add a two story porch. I don't know if it was like oh. a full wraparound porch or just That's like a, beautiful, but like, though. you know, somewhere to like yeah. have a rocking chair and enjoy the scene. Of course. Smoke a cigar, smoke your pipe. Yeah. Read your book, watch the people, all the things. Get some fresh air because no one was uh, washing their undergarments daily back then. <laughs> yes. Let the breeze waft up your pantaloons. And also the grand entry door that was replaced. And so really just like the majority of the woodwork in the home was kind of more of like from this era, from the renovations he did in 1808, because he did change a lot of the interior. But it's not like he mm. was making poor decisions either. Because like at first I read that and I was like, ah, how dare he take out the character of this historic home? It's still a very stunning property. And also this is still like what, the 1800s? So still very historical yes. in terms of when he's adding the addition onto it. Totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, like people were pooping in pans underneath their beds when it was first made. So let's not judge things too harshly here. The lawns, though, were very beautiful. They're surrounded by trees and shrubs. And he like made it so that it was comfortable to go on these strolls outside, which sounds so beautiful. There were these stables on the property for 60 horses. There was 60. 60. So I imagine they had some horseback riding available. I don't know. Of course. Maybe some polo. There was an ice house and the property was also accessible by steamboat, which I just love that you could you could take your horse or your automobile or a steamboat yeah. eventually in the future. Man, it's one of those things where like there's so many aspects of history that I would love to go back and just experience, but it's because it's so foreign from like what mm-hmm. we are currently living. Yeah. And I'm sure it has lots of qualms. I would absolutely miss a lot of the modern day novelties that we experience. But I think it just, it's a little bit more simple. Yeah. It's just the, it's the hygiene piece of it. I could do with like relying on a fireplace and wood for warmth and, you know, opening all of the windows and stuff for a cool breeze and do that. I could live that way. It's the hygiene piece of it that I could not. But knowing what you know, if you're going back in time from now, you would be able to make sure you take care of your hygiene. Especially if you're living in such luxury like this, you know, they, they're they're running bathwater. True. Yeah. And I mean, when I go back, unless I end up being a servant, if I am like the you person bring your who lives in the mansion. Yeah, I bring my ASOP. Everyone's like, what is this? I'm like, find your own business. <laughs> this is expensive as hell. <laughs> Fetch me some cow milk. Busy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the meanest person to ever go back in time. Like I have, wait, do you know the comedian Nate Bregazzi? No. Oh, he's very hilarious. He's one of like the cleanest comedians. I'm going to a show in a couple of weeks in Boston, but he has this whole bit about how 
if he were ever going back in time as a time traveler, that he would be able to offer them nothing. He'd be like, oh yeah, like we have, we can talk to each other on on these devices that we call our iPhones. Like you can access all the information you'd ever want in the world and you can call someone across the world and have a conversation with them. And they'd be like, oh my God, that's incredible. How do you do it? And he'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> and it, I feel honestly, like yeah, that would be us. I don't know. That is truly when I think about the science and like the tech and engineering and whatever the terms are that it takes to create our current social interactions Mm -hmm. it's almost as confounding as like thinking about the big picture and like what's out there and what's beyond us because my brain was not built that way i do not have the capacity to understand it same i would offer almost nothing yeah to the past you would show them how to twerk we could tell them some ghost stories ghost stories and like weird dance moves yeah, I mean, be like, do you want to know this? I'll, I'll give you lessons in Soldier Boy or Cotton Eye Joe. Choose which one you want to learn today. Choose your own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Teach them the WAP dance. Shock everyone. <laughs> Get immediately sent to like a psychiatric facility. Which, some, some <laughs> we're back in the 1600s again. Everyone's like, we thought we were over this, but this wild woman says she's from the future and is talking about. When you're whopping, you're a witch. Some wet ass pussy. <laughs> Okay, so the hotel's built, it's renovated, it's fixed up, it's really popular, everybody wants to go there, it's super beautiful, and of mm-hmm. course it is, because it was, and it still is. But just a couple years later, the cursed property was once again cursed, only this time it was not a fire. It was the War of 1812, mm. which, if anyone ever wants to hack into my iPad, my password is 1812 because of the War of 1812, What? Is the nerdiest thing I've ever said. Why? Because it produced so many dead people in the streets of Burlington, Vermont, and I was fascinated by all the construction that would happen when I was in high school. And they'd like find artifacts and skeletons of people who died during the War of 1812. And we'd go out on my boat in the summer. My dad would be like, oh, you see that rock? Blah, 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 1812 war. This person. I just was like inundated with facts about 1812. I didn't know that you were such an 1812 nerd. I'm an 1812 girly. (laughs) Wow. Catch my first tattoo being 1812. 1812. (laughs) All right, but this is not about me or that weirdness. It's always about us. (laughs) (sighs) The next person to buy this house bought it through the public auction, and it was one of the wealthiest men in America, or he became one of the wealthiest men in America while he lived there. So it was like this string of bad luck with like the house having people who were like arrested or the house just kind of like falling into ruin or lots of war and dead bodies around it or fires. And then suddenly this person came, seemingly broke the curse if there ever was one. And he just got super freaking rich, which. Oh, doing what? Great question. Didn't bother to look it up. (laughs) You saw Rich and you got jealous and didn't continue. (laughs) Yeah. He was like in the railroads or oil or something like that, you know? Mm, One of those typical. He got rich walking on other people's necks. Yeah, as a lot of people back then did. Yeah. And still do. His kids went on to own the home after he passed away. And then they sold it. They subdivided the land. And the proprietary house was converted into a Presbyterian retirement home. Then it was converted into a hotel again. And then it was a boarding house. And eventually, a group of Perth Amboy citizens were like, enough. This is a historical property, and we need to stop scooping things out and putting weird things back in. And so they founded the Westminster Historical Society to raise funds to purchase the house and restore it. Today, the property is in the New Jersey Historic Trust and the Division of Parks and Forestry. It is also registered on both the state and national registers of historic places. And then in 2011... They began the restoration project to restore the house to be historically accurate to its old time period, its original That's state. That's really cool. Yeah. They like analyze the woodwork and the paint colors and they have all these old records and stuff. Wow. And so they're working very slowly over time, but working mm-hmm. to get it back to its prime so that we can visit it and kind of like see the history. And I think that's also hard. It's almost harder now to restore because a lot of the materials used back then One, now are so extremely expensive in today's day and age. But then two, like a lot of it had really toxic chemicals and things in them that would kill people. Right. Yeah. So it's like, how much can you really experiment with? 
getting that historical color extremely accurate when they were using something. Also, when it comes to like the curse, like clearly you look at the history of it and so many things happen to the house. But when you look at how many buildings from early settlements of America mm-hmm. that did get destroyed and how many are actually left, clearly this this house has survived. You know, it, it was dealt it a lot of blows, but it survived. And it, I mean, it's the only one, too, of its kind that survived, which is even more incredible. Also, I just have to say this out loud because I'm so distracted by it. And I have been for the past two days. You know how like your nose and your taste buds can get really weird, both when you're sick, but also like when you're pregnant. Yeah. I'm struggling so much because my worst nightmare has come true. All the clothes that I wear smell like sewage to me now. It your doesn't clothes? matter if I put them. Yeah. Different laundry detergents, whatever. It's just the past couple days. It's all smelled like sewage to me. Is it? What about like lotion? Can you put like lotion on, or, on you to, to kind of like smell something else? Oh, God, I'm smelling it right now. It's so gross. Or put like va- Vicks Vapor Rub under your nose. Yeah, I should. And water is starting to smell like like a florally soap. I hate it. Yikes. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so weird what happens to the body. I know. Help me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so now if you go visit the proprietary house, you can go visit it as a museum. They're open for tours. They have events. They offer guided tours, concerts, teas, and ghost tours because of course it's haunted it'd be shocking if it weren't yes so many groups of individuals they've flocked to this space to investigate the property they even hold ghost tours around halloween which are said to include some historical reenactments which i'm like oh best of both worlds for us i want to go that would be so fun yeah there was one group there uh there were three investigators from the jersey unique minds paranormal society and they visited the property for a nighttime investigation And at one point, one of the investigators, they felt really called to the tea room. And so she walked into the tea room all alone and nothing happened. So she was like, okay. She wandered back out through a different part of the house. And then later when she came back into the tea room, she felt someone grab the back of her neck, which is so aggressive. In a really aggressive way? I think so. Because when she reported this, like the next day to whoever, you know, was in charge of the house or or renting it out to them. Mm -hmm. It turns out this was not the first time that this had happened. Apparently, there are several people who have experienced this over the years all around the tea room, like this section of the property, and they've reported feeling someone grab their neck, and they don't know who it is or why, but it is a little bit aggressive. I will say (laughs) it's very aggressive. Uh, There is a rumor that back in the day, this place was used at one time as a brothel. And so I really hope that this sort of like aggressive, violent behavior is not left over from that period of time. Hmm. The only other thing I can think of is like if this was one of the owner's like rooms that was exclusively for him or like Mm. I'm thinking of like a male forward like cigar lounge back in the day, like where women weren't allowed in it. And so if like they see a woman walk in, there's this like. You're not allowed in here. I mean, it, it's aggressive and I don't like right. it regardless, but. I mean, now it's a tea room, so it's going to be a lot of women <laughs> walking in there. So many women. <laughs> well, another thought I had was like, okay, so when William Franklin was arrested, it was said that he was arrested on the steps of the property. But I'm curious if there was something else, like, you know, if maybe mm. he wasn't arrested right on the steps or if they had to enter the house and kind of like find him and perhaps there was some sort of aggressive altercation in the process of arresting him. And maybe that's some of the residual energy. But it feels so active, you know? It It feels like such a choice rather than a residual. Yeah, it does feel like an intelligent haunting. Yeah, to like specifically grab someone in that spot. I don't know. Right. Although, okay, here's another option that could make it a little bit more residual, even though it's kind of odd to think of a residual haunting as being able to make contact with someone physically. There was a rumor that there is a staircase in this house that was the site of a murder. And I don't know where that staircase is. I don't know any of the details about that murder. I don't know if there's any truth to it, if the staircase is close to the tea room. But I feel like that would mm. make sense if there was a murder, you know, like having your neck grabbed, suffocation, sure. or just like I mean, even control just like over someone. The house being destroyed during the War of 1812. Like, yeah. that means that there was attacks happening to people, either right in that house, mm-hmm. around the house, in order for the house to be right. damaged that way. Yeah, I mean, if we think of Gettysburg, there's like guns going off, cannons, people doing marches with their platoons. 
all around. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's a, yeah, I agree with you, Sabrina. It does kind of feel like there's more of like an entity or a spirit that's consciously trying to choke people out or grab them right. or or something. And I'm not into that. So no. I don't know how much I want to go to this house for like an overnight. But I think going to just go would be cool. Also, the tea room, I will say when you were like, oh, maybe it was a spot that men like would hang around and have cigars or whatever. So it was once a wine cellar. And then it was also rumored to be used as a dungeon at one point. There's nothing more romantic and like medieval than a wine cellar slash dungeon. Right. Yeah. I hope it was both of those things at one time. Right. So if you're held captive, at least you can enjoy some nice wine. Yeah. We will insert a, a photo into the YouTube video if people are watching to look at the tea room. But Sabrina, it looks a lot like the in the clay pit, the Indian restaurant in oh, Austin, yeah. Texas that's haunted. Uh -huh. It looks like that downstairs. That's immediately what I was picturing, like the brick yeah. arched walls. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So this paranormal investigative group, they also had a bit of K2 meter activity in the basement and a couple of them heard what sounded like someone walking and then something crunching. And they they heard it at different times and in different areas of the house. And mm -hmm. this group also had a bunch of other experiences as well. And many of these experiences are experiences other people have reported. So it's like, it seems like whoever goes into this house and does paranormal investigations or they're just like there and happen to experience the paranormal, there's just a few types of hauntings or a few like kind of signature moves that this house has to show that it's signature active. moves yeah the house has an mo <laughs> someone's doing uh only dances to daddy yankee songs upstairs and until we show them the wop dance of course yeah and then yeah megan stallion takes over the wine cellar <laughs> people will hear footsteps strange noises bathroom doors locking on their own door handles and drawers will open and close on their own and actually, I wasn't sure. So I was reading a bunch of articles about different groups who went in and their experiences. And I don't know if this was the Jersey Unique Minds Paranormal Society or if this was another group who experienced it. But there was uh, a report of an investigation where the investigators, someone was looking for a tablecloth because they were going to set up the table, probably, I don't know, with snacks or whatever. We've been there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't know where the tablecloth was. And so they were kind of like wandering around trying to find it. And then he heard a noise, and so he went to investigate the noise. Like, is someone in the other room? Is this paranormal? And a drawer had physically been opened. He goes over to the drawer. He looks in it, and they're tablecloths. So whoever was haunting it was, like, witnessing oh, him rummaging so around nice. trying to find the tablecloths. And they were like, let me help him out. Yes. They helped That's him. That's sweet. I like that. That's yeah. my favorite type of haunting, like a helpful right? spirit. I it's agree. like, I am sick and tired of watching you putz around looking for something. Let me just, let me just show you. Yeah. It seems like the only problems you'll face in this house too are in the basement, in the, near the tea room. So it's like, if you avoid that area, then, okay. then you're fine. You're going to find helpful ghosts. Yeah. So while well, some people are having their necks grabbed near the tea room, other people are being helped. And some people also have reported feeling what seems like a child's hand, like a small hand grabbing at their shirts and yanking as if to get Aww. their attention. And not only that, but the top floor of the building was used as an office space. I think it might still be used as office spaces for, you know, some of those like historical society, you know, different right. divisions. Kind of reminds me of like the Rhode Island Historical Society, which is like in that yes. beautiful old house, but it's office spaces. Right. The top floor is like everybody has a different office and they're all doing different things mm -hmm. for it. So someone had said that one day in her office, this like old children's toy appeared and she was kind of freaked out. And she was like, how did this get here? Went to her coworkers and all of them were like, what the hell? How could this get here? And the mystery was never solved, I guess, because it's like no one That's, admitted to it. Everyone seemed very. What they do with the toy? Like, where is it now? I have no idea. That to me sounds like a reason to believe that there's a part of the paranormal world that is just like dimension hopping like yeah, or like glitching into a ours. crossing of timelines totally and also it's like well if there is a child here if this property is big who knows if this child has wandered outside of the house who knows if he goes home with people sometimes and then returns like what if he mm -hmm. stole it what if he saw this toy in someone's closet in their basement 
tucked away in their like keepsake box. And he was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to take this home with me. And then found a little yeah. hiding spot for it so that he wouldn't get in trouble. And it just happened to be under this woman's desk. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like this kid was playing with this toy in a different timeline. And this kid, like I'm thinking like 1800s and this kid all of a sudden mm. is like, where did my toy go? And like they're they're dealing with the mystery of his toy just completely went missing. Yeah. And oh, it's because it came to our timeline. It's like Halloween town when people lose things and it goes to that one guy's house. With the socks, missing socks. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So this little boy, when he is seen, people say that he's dressed in blue. And so people are attributing some of the hauntings that are happening there, some things being like blue. moved and misplaced with this little child wearing blue, this little boy. Who is he? We don't know. Why is he there? How do you get there? We don't know. But he does seem to be kind of interested in the people around him and people who are coming into the property. He That's isn't cool. too scared of you know the living activity happening in this house. It is said that he actually opened the door one time for a delivery man and he led this man up to the third floor for the delivery. How they figured out it was a ghost, I don't know the rest of the story. That was all that was said online that I could find. But yeah, he was like, oh, who are you delivering to? Oh, yeah, they're upstairs. I'll show you. (laughs) That is so cool. This Okay, and here's a call to action. If anyone is a delivery person, if you're like Uber Eats, FedEx, UPS, whatever, laser ship, what are some weird ass things that you've encountered? On the I job, feel like the same the delivery with like process. construction workers and yeah. people who like set up security systems in houses. Like I just want to know mm. all the stories. I also yeah, would love to too. hear from like 911 operators because I'm sure there's probably like paranormal like calls that come in. I would love to have a collection oh, yeah. of those. How do you even know? How do you differentiate? I guess if it's like a vacant house. Well, it always makes me think of the the second or third conjuring movie the one that took place of the enfield poltergeist when they first called the police and the police were basically like witnessing all of these weird things happening in the house and they were like we are not qualified goodbye yeah or even do you remember the bell witch i feel like i go back to the bell witch cave so often over the past seven years of us podcasting and we did cover it right in the beginning But the Bell Witch Cave, it was like the sheriff and a bunch of his like fellow law enforcement slept over on the property that one night or they came to try to sleep over and they were so scared that that. they ran off the property. Interesting. I'll have to go back and listen to that one. Yeah, something like that. I know, me too. Guests on this property have also reported seeing the spirit of a woman. We have a lady in white at the proprietary house in New Jersey and she stands in the dining room window and she has been wandering other parts of the mansion as well, once descending down the staircase in front of very surprised and confused witnesses. Ooh. And apparently there's even a ghost from the Revolutionary War. There's a soldier here, or maybe soldiers, because guests sure. have reported seeing Revolutionary War soldiers wandering the grounds. They often appear as shadowy figures. People hear really heavy footsteps, and they're basically theorizing that these are the weight of the shoe is because they're these like colonial era boots that soldiers would wear. Mm, Sure. And there are a lot of orbs of light that are also seen and people have attributed, I don't know why, but they've attributed the light orbs to the Revolutionary War soldiers. Hmm. I'm sure there's probably some connection or like they hear something in tandem with it. To try to right. tie those together. Yeah. Like maybe they're all always like out in the field or something, which is right. where the soldiers are seen too sometimes. But yeah, that's a little bit of the history and some of the hauntings at the proprietary house in New Jersey. Wow. So it's your home state, Sabrina. I'm curious. What do you what do you think? Do you think that this should be added to our list? Or is it just a drive by? I would go, I would do an overnight there. Because it doesn't seem well, one, I think it would be beautiful to do. It's one of those houses that I would just want to wander the interior. Mm-hmm. Honestly, everyone just open your doors. Let me just wander around real quick. I won't take anything. I just want to look. And it's not uh, terribly scary. I feel like you could learn a lot of history and perhaps contact. Maybe yeah. even, I feel like this is one of those places you could potentially have like a glitch in the Matrix time glitch mm. experience. Yeah, especially with the toy and not really having an understanding of how that happened. 
Yeah. It very much could. The little boy could lead you into the portal. I would love that. I almost feel like, to be honest, it's a little bit haunting light for my taste. I might have I to go to the tea room Ugh. to experience the thrill in life. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, of course I'll go there. It's just the threat of my neck being grabbed by the tea room that yeah. I'm kind of like, mm, I don't know about that. Because everywhere we've gone and investigated so far, there's no reputation of like being physically attacked. Grabbed. Yeah. Well. Well, yeah, you're right. Conjure. That's not true. <laughs> Except for We've when just <laughs> evaded the the being grabbed. Yeah. That was like a specific target. Sure. Versus just like general people going going in. Yeah. We set intentions and say like, hey, so and so would like to be touched, so and so would not like to be touched. Mm -hmm. If you touch us, it has to be polite and kind, no grabbing, no meanness. Yes. So I don't have a story specifically about the proprietary house, but I do have a story that takes place in New Jersey. And Great. it is from our listener, Rachel. And it has a couple parts to it because Rachel sent us updates, but they're all pretty short. Okay. So it is called Hat Man in My New Apartment. Hi, ladies. My name is Rachel. I adore your podcast and I have been listening for over a year now. You make my job a little less monotonous and I listen to you guys so often that it feels like I'm just sitting with friends at work. <laughs> I have a story for you about my new apartment because I think I'm being followed by a hat man. Okay. When I was five or six in my childhood home in Warren County, New Jersey, I used to wake up very early while it was still dark out and I would go downstairs by myself. One morning, I went downstairs and the light in our dining room, which is through an archway off our kitchen, was on. Now, this was weird because my parents are anal about turning off lights and saving power. So it was really odd that it was on and I could see it was on from down the hall. When I walked into the kitchen, it was there that I saw a tall, dark figure with a big hat. It looked like it was shaped like a big straw hat. He didn't have a shadow, so I didn't really realize he was there until I was in the kitchen. He didn't say or do anything, but all of a sudden, the light shut off, and I heard something run across the floor and directly past me. It almost sounded Ugh. like a rodent's claws scratching on the ground. Yeah, gross. The fact that it's like low to the ground like that is so freaky. Yeah. When my eyes adjusted to the dark, he was gone, and I didn't see him again. After that incident, I, one, never went downstairs alone again, and two, other things started happening in our house. The sounds of things falling, voices of deceased family members, radios that were not plugged in turning on all of a sudden, doors opening and closing, and the sound of people walking around when nobody was there. You know, the basics. Anyway, I didn't remember the hat man until listening to your podcast and finding out he had a name, but I shrugged it off because the idea made me a little nervous. But a few months ago, my best friend, Julia, who's also a listener and a big fan of the occult, moved into our apartment in North Jersey after our college graduation. Our building is very old, built in 1927, and we have been one of the few apartments left that has not been renovated completely. We still have original floors, moldings, and radiators. When we first moved in, I was convinced something in the building had to be haunted because it was so old. And it was just the feeling I got. So I saged the place and it was quiet. There was no activity. But one weekend this summer, Julia's little sister came over to sleep for the weekend. And since we were all fans of ghosts and the paranormal, we talked all about it. And I was telling Julia's sister about all of my haunted happenings. And she told me that her best friend recently saw a ghost man with a hat while she was on vacation. Mm. So I sent her the episode you guys did on the hat man and she showed her friend. They are now both mortified and I do feel pretty bad about terrifying them like that with your episode. <laughs> However, <laughs> I love this. Yeah, love passing this. on the hauntings. Because it's like, instead of being like, oh, wow, that is scary, but I'm sure it's nothing. It's like, do you want to know everything it could be? Here's an episode <laughs> on it. <laughs> Here's a way to make you even more scared. However, that night was the first time I truly thought about my hat man since the first time I saw him. And when I fell asleep, I had a dream that Julia's little sister told me our apartment felt wrong. And when I asked why, she pointed behind me and said, because of him. When I turned around, in my dream, my heart dropped because I saw the man in the hat behind me in my room. We looked each other in the eye and I all of a sudden sprung awake. I couldn't go back to sleep. I didn't tell Julia or her little sister. But the next morning, her little sister said that she couldn't sleep that night either. Maybe it was just because we were talking about it all night and listening to these haunted stories. Mm, but mm -hmm. just to be safe, that night I saged my room 
because I don't have time for real men and definitely not ghost men wasting my time. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, get all that negativity out. You don't need any of that. (laughs) Since that event, whenever I'm home alone at night, after my door is closed for the evening, I will hear loud thumping on the floor in the living room, which is right outside my door. It's as though someone is slamming furniture down on the floor. It stops if I leave my door open, but when I leave my door open, I get like a really bad feeling that I don't like. Oh. I have a feeling that because I've saged my room that this hat man can't enter it. So he makes noise outside of my room because he's frustrated and he likes when the door is open because then he can see me. (sighs) Yep. Most recently, when I'm lying in bed and my window is open, I can hear a man whispering. I can never understand what he's saying, but it sounds like he's all around me until I close my window or reach for the sage. I'll be saging my apartment again this weekend since the whispering has just started. I don't feel unsafe. I never did, but it feels unsettling to the point where I feel like he needs to be warded off. I just want to take a nap without a ghost whispering sweet nothings to me through my window. Okay, and now update. Hi girls, me again. So I haven't had a chance to sage since my last email and I am in trouble. I have a very good friend who lives in London named Danny. She is sadly currently battling cancer and just had a double mastectomy and has been doing well after a long period of bad health problems. Oh, good. She initially was told that she may only have a few months to live, but now things seem to be going well. Yay. Yeah. So her friend convinced her to go to a psychic. Despite her being a skeptic, she was like, okay, I'll go just to see what my future holds. So she went. And they told her the usual stuff, saying she'll die younger than she's supposed to, but will still live a long, full life. Because she's a bit of a pessimist, she thought it was BS. Until she was walking out of the shop. The psychic was like, wait. The psychic asked if Danny had a friend who was from a faraway place who was being followed by a hat man. Stop! That's too specific! What is the psychic's name? We need their contact. Danny said yes. And the psychic told Danny... Tell your friend she must take care. Danny immediately called me because I'm her only friend in the U.S. who talks about ghosts. And Danny has never believed in ghosts, but she was shaken when the psychic asked her that. Safe to say, I'm leaving work early today to sage my apartment. Okay. Holy shit. Also, this is from 2019. These are all like updates from 2019. So then a week after that second follow-up, Rachel emailed, hi again. This past week, I was finally able to sage my apartment following my friend's spooky visit to the psychic. In the middle of staging my apartment and praying, a big black bird hit the window in my living room when I was right next to it. Mm, No. This bird fully smacked the window and was stunned for a few minutes laying on top of the AC unit. I was so scared it was dead until I tapped the window and saw it was alive and it flew off. Oh my God. I'm pretty well informed about birds in our area, but I had never seen a bird like that before. It was big and black, but looked nothing like a crow or a juvenile raven, which are the only blackbirds equivalent in size to what I saw. Is it a shadow bird, perhaps? Anyway, staging my apartment and blessing it with salt made it feel much lighter, and my life in general has improved since the cleansing. Hopefully this is the last time you hear from me about this particular experience. See you on the other side, Rachel. Maybe it was like a grackle or something. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, Rachel, what the fuck? It's... <laughs> In the very beginning, like the first few paragraphs, I was like, okay, you know, maybe this is nice. Like everybody's experiencing Uh some hauntings. You have other people in your life and it doesn't sound horrible, but now it really does seem like the fact that there's the thuds on the floor and like the scampering shadows and activity, like it just wants access to you. What I don't like, and this reminds me of our listener who first initially shared it to us on Campfire Stories. But like how talking about it gives it more power because it sounds Mm -hmm. like Rachel, for the most part, aside from the couple experiences in the childhood home, didn't have a ton of encounters with this entity going forward. Right. The second she and her roommate and her roommate sister start talking about it, he returned. Yes. And it's so strong and it like seems so much like there's a real target on Rachel, that a a psychic was able to pick up on it and be like, ooh, I sense some ill will from this one entity towards a friend of yours. Here's what he looks like. Like the fact that that like permeates through the veil and other people can pick up on the energy and read that, that's, there's a plan. 
But I almost also like, okay, what else did the psychic say? Like, just tell her to take care. What, what, what does that mean? That's so how? ominous. <laughs> take care how? What's the yes. solution here, lady? Right. Well, sounds like the saging and cleansing our space that way is working. I mean, this was 2019 Ish. and I don't think we've gotten any more updates. Are you okay, Rachel? Rachel, that's the last email we have. It's from 2019. Hopefully Rachel just like fully got rid of it, you know? Do tell us though, please. We need an update on your haunting and safety. Ah, please. Ah. Well, all. Okay, okay. We love you okay. all. And we hope we that no ghosties are following you and touching your toesies. Unless you want them to, of course. And if they are, please email us at two girls one ghost podcast at gmail.com. We will collect any story. Let us be your ghostly dear diary. Send us even hauntings that haven't completely found their conclusion. Just yes, let us know active, what's happening. Active hauntings. We love, well, we, ho- we hope it's not scaring you, but we do love active haunting stories. We love when you're haunted. <laughs> we love when you're like going through horrible hauntings and you share it with us. <laughs> And we get to be from the safety of behind our computers being like, wow, that sounds awful. (laughs) Yeah. But hey, maybe sharing it will give it less power because they're not alone. Or also we can harness the manifestation powers of this community, which I'm really leaning into lately. And let's just be a big ass coven and banish the negativity in the world. Yeah. Well, if you want to fall further down the rabbit hole that is ghost stories with two girls one ghost you can follow us on social media you can rate and review us on itunes and tell other people about us which is so helpful because then you grow your personal community of uh, ghost lovers and can converse with people about that it's a pyramid scheme and then also you can join our patreon we have some awesome things on patreon it's just one tier five dollars a month to become our most haunted friend we have a discord that has a Patreon-only channel. People are conversing all the time there. We go live on Patreon every once in a while. We also have ad-free and one-week early episodes. Every single and episode book club. is- We have book club. We have so many an things. exclusive Patreon episode, which is a full-length version of our podcast come out every single month mm-hmm. just for the Patreon members and a bunch of other cool things. So many cool things. We love you all. Thank you so much for listening to us and coming back week after week. We're so grateful. And thank you to our editor, Jamie, for editing and producing both our audio and video every week. We're very, very grateful for you. And we will see See you on the other side. side.